So um, when you open up a new, create a new file in Illustrator to do the layout, um, you want to select tabloid in uh, landscape layout so it's longer on the horizontal axis. And click OK. And then when you want to bring your scanned files in, you want to use this place function, which most of you did. So if I just go somewhere, oops, ignore this stuff. <laughs> uh, if I just find an image, I must have images. That's what I do for a living. None in there. Picture of me. How about that? Um, so when you place this, make sure this link is turned off. Okay, that's the problem that some of you had. That was turned on, and so when you sent me the image without the original file, it couldn't find it, and I couldn't see it. So if you happen to do that, if you place an image in here, um, and you forgot to unlink it, the way you can embed it, so there's linking and embedding, right? So under Window, there's a Links palette here. Mine's already open. And so you can see that this one is linked, and you can just choose to embed the image up here. So by embedding, it's not locking it anywhere in the image. It's just locking it as part of the image. Okay. So now it's no longer a linked image, and you'll get this icon showing that it's embedded. And that just means when you hand it in, all of those pieces of data are actually in this one file. So let's delete me. So. Um, when you do your layout, in addition to bringing in the images, you have to add some figurative elements. Um, those are leader lines, labels, things like that. So I just wanted to show you some of the tools uh, for doing that sort of stuff. So you've used the pen tool before to actually draw stuff, right? So that's easy. Uh, let's open up our layers palette here. I have open somewhere. So the other thing I want you to do while you're working on these files is just to make sure you're separating everything into different layers. So when you place your images in here, you'll want to have each one on its own layer. So if I just go and do that placing again, let's not do me. Let's do something else. I must have, well, I've got pictures of ears, that's good. So picture of the ear from the front, so I'm going to turn off the link. I'm going to place that. Oops. So when you want to move around a whole object in Illustrator, you know, use the black arrow to do that. And then we're going to just label all these things. So I want to see all this in your Illustrator file. Everything is clearly laid out and labeled. And now if I place another image. So I placed it without putting it on a new layer. So if I want to move this to a new layer, I can simply click on a new layer. So I've got a new layer created now. But you can see that this front ear is still on the old layer, but it's selected. So the easiest way to move it to a new layer in the Layers palette with just that one image selected, or this one item on this layer selected, you can see there's a little blue dot here. It means that there's a selected item on this layer. So if I just grab this blue dot, I can drag it up here, and now it's on this layer. So I can call this side ear. Okay, so I want you to organize things like that. And then for, you're going to have things like inset, so you'll have an inset layer. And you're going to have to organize these things so they sit on top of each other in, in the appropriate way. And then you'll have text and titles, so Let's say we want to make a title layer. And the reason that you want to do this is so you can easily lock down the things you don't want to move anymore. Just by clicking the icon here beside the eyeball, you can lock those layers so they don't move. You can't inadvertently select these things. 
Oh, one other thing before we do the title is that when you're setting this up, you're going to want to align certain things. So if you see my description of the illustration, those are all your assignments. There. Oh, there it is. So you can see I've got the anterior view beside the left lateral view underneath the occlusal view. But all of these things should line up. All right, so um, the edge of this should match the edge of this. The bottom of the anterior view should match the, the bottom border of the mandible. So I just did this roughly, but everything should be lined up. So when you want to line things up in Illustrator, you can do it in a couple of ways. Um, let me just unlock these layers. If I select these two things, I can select them both and go to Object, I can arrange to change their order if they're on um, a separate, uh, if they're on the same layer. But I may want to turn on um, snapping too. So I can turn on uh, snap to grid and move these things around and it will try to line them up. So you, it's probably hard to see, but they're jumping around a little bit rather than moving freely. So you can line things up that way. There's also an align palette here, so we can click on align and it will give us different options for lining things up. So if I want to select these two things and then make sure their top borders are aligned, I can choose the whoops, the proper align icon. So you can make it out just from what the icons are showing. So this is a vertical top align here. So it's going to just make sure these things are lined up. So for a publishable illustration, you want to have all this stuff squared away uh, so people can uh, equate structures from one view to structures on another view. But a lot of the time when you bring in your image, your, the actual size of the image, the top of the image, might not equate to the actual image content itself. In that case, you have to line up things by hand. And you've used guides before uh, for doing your scaling. But when you do a guide in Illustrator, it's better to uh, create a new layer for the guides so you can lock them down. And so let's say I wanted to line up a couple of pieces on here, like the high, height of the antitragus here. So I can just turn on rulers here in Illustrator, which is Command-R on the guides layer. And I can drag down a guide where I want them to be able to line up. And I can lock down this layer. And then I can move my images to line up the antitragus here, which I actually can't see. But let's say I wanted to do that. So when you're lining things up too, you can use your mouse, but you can also use your arrow keys on your keyboard to nudge things into position. So I want to see all that stuff nicely lined up. And so the scale of each should be uh, equivalent, so they should match well. Any questions about that so far? I know some of you have more experience with Illustrator than others, so I just wanted to go over that. Okay. So let's look at now doing the titles. So on this layer, so I can just turn off the visibility of the guides here. On this layer, I can use the text tool. So everybody did this to add text to their uh, their last images, but just as a reminder, um, so I can use the type tool here and just click and type, you know, here's is the title. So we have to look at what size we want depending on the uh, size of your the image that you're creating. So I'm just going to open my my type character uh, menu set. So Command T. There we go. Sorry, I've got so little room on this screen that I can't find anything. Oh, there we go. So with it. The type selected, you can choose the point size here. Now I'm working quite big, so you can see for a title, you might want to make something quite big like this, and then you can choose the font. So the default is Myriad Pro. That's a sans serif font. 
but you might want to use something like Helvetica. I, like I was saying, I was looking for what the different journals want, but I couldn't find anything for the uh, American Journal of Physical Anthropology. Uh, but there might be something there that I, I missed, so you can look into it. So you can use something like Gil Sans is a good uh, sans serif font, or Helvetica. Helvetica, I don't know if it's on the PC. It might only be uh, Arial. And the PC is the Helvetica copy. But Gil Sans should be on the uh, PC, so that's a good one to use as well. But I, you'd want to line up text and things like that too. You don't want to have, you know, a title here and then a subtitle underneath it. If there's anything that's going to upset my feeling of things being right in the world, it's when things are just slightly off. So. You want to use your guides to move things to make sure that everything lines up. You don't want to see text like this. You want to use something that's going to line them up. You can grab a guide, snap these things to a guide. So I just want to see nice, tidy work like that. So you can use your text tool to add labels and things. So how are we going to add leader lines? Well, when you want to draw lines in Illustrator, you've seen that we can use, I'll just hide this, I'll create a new layer. Now I'm not going to give you a sort of prescription for how thick these lines should be. You're going to have to evaluate that based on how dense the stipple is on your image and what works and what doesn't work. But the easiest way to do this, instead of using the pen tool, is just to use this line tool right beneath. And you can just click and drag to go from one to the other, from one point to another. And so you can see right now that there's nothing being drawn here because this has no stroke. If you look in the toolbar here, this is no fill, no stroke. So if I just double click on the stroke, I can just give it black. We're just working in black and white, so everything should be black. And then if we, oops, that didn't work. It also didn't work. Oh, it's because I don't have it selected. <laughs> oh, it did, it did work, but it's just very faint. So if you want to increase the stroke weight of something, this menu set may be open here when you create this so you can change the stroke weight just by selecting the object with the black arrow and then turning up the stroke weight. Now obviously something like this is too thick um, but you can modify this so it works with your image. This is also too thick but whatever. And you may want to add an arrowhead or something. So you, if you're pointing at a discrete object, you can add an arrowhead that's pointing right at it. So let's say you had to label the mental foramen, which is a discrete object on the mandible. So in this case, you'd probably want to use an arrowhead. And so to add an arrowhead, now there are different ways to do this in Illustrator, but um, you can go to Effect, Stylize, Oh, no, it's different now. Effect. Uh, things I should remind myself of before class. Note to self. Oh, this is different from CS5. Hold on a sec. Oh, I can't remember. I'll have to find out. No, I'll, I'll figure it out <laughs> in a few minutes. Is it under stroke? Oh, okay, so under the stroke. Oh, yeah. Thank you. 
So, yes, under the stroke menu, that's what I was going to say, seeing if anybody else knew. Um, so that stuff is up here, but if you go into window and open the stroke palette, then it gives you more options. Um, one thing here is you can change the stroke weight directly, so I've got a five-point line here. And then you can add arrowheads on the beginning or the end of the stroke here. So you can use something simple like uh, this size, and then you can use the scale to change it because it will probably be too big. It's big. It's not going to adjust itself based on your stroke weight. So you have to adjust the scale here. If you're identifying a region uh, rather than a distinct space, you might want to use something uh, different like a dot here. Or you could draw a circle if it's supposed to be labeling a whole region that you want to encircle with a bigger piece. But you have to be careful that that piece of figurative data is not overriding too heavily the thing you're trying to show. So uh, a larger area you probably label with a circle like this and just adjust its weight. So another thing you can do with these, since we're just dealing with black and white, um, you might want to add a drop shadow to these. Now adding a black drop shadow isn't going to help, so um, instead you can go to Effect, Stylize, and add a drop shadow and make it a, a white drop shadow. So the things to consider here, let me just zoom in so we can see what's going on. So I'm going to change the color to white here. We don't want any other color other than black or white. So the mode is multiply, and so we haven't talked about blend modes at all, but just to know that when you've got layers of information, so you've got different layers, you've got the line sitting on top of that photograph of the ear. Um, when you have different things, by default, Ma uh, not Maya, Illustrator deals with them normally. So uh, it will, if there's something on top, it will just occlude the things below. But you can also have sort of mathematical interpretation between them. And so if something is set to multiply, that means anything dark on above, above will be multiplied to the things below. So black is equal to zero, if we think about these colors as numbers. And so if you multiply the things below black by zero, they will also turn black. So if we have a white shadow here, multiply doesn't work because it multiplies everything by one. White is one. So we want to just change this to normal or to add, but normal will work. And then we can just change the offset in X. So X is horizontal, Y is vertical. Or wait, yeah. Um, so we can change this to move the drop shadow. Turn on preview. So you can see that it's kind of this blurry white. So we just want the drop shadow to be below the line. So we can change the Y offset to go below. Turn down the blur to nothing. reduce the offset so you just get a fine line beneath it. So it's going to give some visual room between the content and the figure. It'll help raise these this image off. Oh, so you can see my offset is way too far here. So something like this, just below. It doesn't even have to be a full millimeter. And the other thing I didn't do, which is... Uh, this was set to 75% opacity. We can't have that, because that will give us a gray uh, beneath, because the black will show through. So we have to make a change. So if you have to make a change to this, you have to open up another palette uh, called um, Appearance with that thing selected, and it will show all the different things that have been applied to this stroke. And one of the things is this drop shadow. So now I can click on this, it will open this again, and I can change the opacity to 100. And then I've got a nice clean white drop shadow. So the other thing um, that I want you to think about is how you line up text with leader lines. Now this sounds like I'm being overly finicky, but 
Um, to make a clean illustration, you want to get all this stuff uh, nice and lined up. So if I do a piece of text here, ear. I want you to be consistent with how you line these things up. So if you're lining up with the bottom of the word here, then everyone should be the same. I don't want some of them like this, some of them like this. So just consistency. So typically the way I do it is I line, uh, the leader lines up with the, the bottom right corner of the word. If it's on the other side of the page, it would be the bottom left corner, if you can. And if you can't, if the, if the arrangement of this is such that it makes it difficult to do that, let me just lock this down. Oops. Then just try and be as consistent as possible. So something like this, I could still line this up with the bottom. But if this was at a, a more severe angle, or if it's on the other side of the page, then we're going to want to line it up with the bottom corner of it like that. If, if things are arranged so it's difficult to do that, then you can go to the top corner, but you just want to keep it uh, consistent and clean. This is a differentiation thing. If it's always consistent how labels and leader lines go together, the viewer can rely on it and they can interpret the image more clearly. And try and keep the uh, drop shadows consistent. So if you have to turn the image around, you might want to have to move the drop shadow so it's as if coming from the same direction for all parts of the image. If you need to make a broken leader line, so something that changes angle, you can use the pen tool for that, or you can use two separate lines. But if you just use the pen tool um, and click, if you hold down shift, it will lock it um, along that axis, so it'll be horizontal. And then click again, you'll get a good angle. Now this has a fill and no stroke, so we just have to change that. So swap that so it's got no fill and a stroke. And then we can adjust the stroke weight to whatever at the arrowheads, which as we all know now is in the stroke menu. Don't use these, like scissors or something, or fingers pointing. <laughs> Just use dots and simple arrows, or nothing. Uh, you don't need an arrowhead if it's not pointing at a discrete thing. If it's just pointing at a region, you can just use an empty uh, a line that ends like that. Okay, any questions about that? I know this is like minutia of creating a document, but I'd like to see just simple things like that to be consistent uh, if you take that away from the course too. So uh, what I'd like to do now is just do a little of the stippling demonstration and then give you a chance to work on the exercise. Let me just look at the assignment to make sure I'm not overlooking anything that you need to know. Oh, when you, you may have to do, well you will have to do an inset and if you want to, to create a, a circle or something, this is just another tool that I'm sure you, most of you already know. But in, beside the line tool, there's the shape tool. So you can choose the ellipse to make a circle. And if you just start clicking and dragging and hold down shift, it will lock it into a circular shape. And then all the same rules apply. You can add drop shadows. You can't add an arrowhead because there's no end, but you can change the stroke weight and things like that. Now in this case, you may want to have a, a white backer behind it, so you can give this one a fill, and so it can sit over top of another image and block it out if, if that needs to be the case. Probably won't be for yours, because you're not going to want to have an inset that blocks out your drawing, but you can do that. Okay, so I'm just going to switch computers here and see if this works. So I just want to talk to you a little bit about actually stippling and creating your image. You know, 
know, the first rule is have something good to, where there's discrete elements, so between a tooth and the mandible, you're going to want to have an edge there, even if it's um, very faintly described, like if there's even not much color differentiation between them. There's no color differentiation on your scan, but in the photos. Oh, maybe not. Spoke too soon. There we So you've been, uh, last week, uh, most of you were rendering out these images from the different views. There's one other image you have to render out, which is the, the midline plane, or the midline cut along the mandibular symphysis here. And so you can see that if you um, turn off whole mandible, so in your display layers, which is over to the right here. My screen looks a little different because everything's compressed right now. Um, but the if you turn off the whole mandible display layer, so turn off the V for visibility, and turn on half mandible, and have the midline plane turned on, here in the side view you'll see a representation of the, the symphysis in the midline. And if you render this out, this is something you can just trace. Sorry, it's hard to see on this screen. I, if I just change this background, I can't change the background plane, but you'll see that there's a silhouette here that shows the shape. It's a little misleading, but this is what you should draw, because there's the break in the mandible is shown in here too. But it gives an idea of the diagnostic uh, angle of the interior, the lingual side of the mandible at the symphysis, which is what you want to record. Okay, so that's the other render you have to do, but just in black, because you can then trace it in Illustrator. Now, I think in the section that I put through here that I caught part of the tooth, too. So what I'd like you to do is to take this, but look at the mandible and see where the, uh, the body of the mandible ends at the alveolar process and where the tooth begins, and not include that part. So cut it out. So you'll have to look at the anatomy and decide for yourself where the tooth ends and the mandible begins. So when you draw this, you're going to do the outline, but you're going to exclude part of this top part here. And again, I'm sorry, it's hard to see, uh, but there's a section through the tooth. But we want to exclude that. Do you say anybody else hear music? Mm -hmm. It's just me. Okay. Um, So you can see that uh, that's this representation of this here. So it's through the midline. So I want you to read through this and look at the stuff that you're trying to include here. So I'm not being too descriptive of all the elements that I want you to describe. You have to read the paper, which I've included in the assignment folder. So what are the important parts of the, the molar that you're trying to show here? And you list them here. How do you calculate the mental frame and height index? I kind of showed you here a little bit, but show the different measurements that are here and what the, the, the result of the height index is. You have to have a figurative element showing where this section is coming from here. So you can create a dotted line. I didn't show you that in Illustrator, but if you select a stroke in Illustrator and open up the strokes menu, you can turn it into a dashed line. So you might want to use a dashed line for something like that. And you can train, change how what the dashing is like by changing the dash and gap value. So if I change it to, from 12 to 3, you can see it's a more 
dotted line. You can change the gap value here to have smaller dots and more spaces. So you'll have to look at that and try and figure out how to make something that shows up over your drawing to show where that cut through the synthesis goes. Now the last thing I'm going to show you in Maya is how to measure things. Okay, So this mandible should be set to actual um, size. So if I turn this back on, there are certain elements in here that you have to measure. Like here's the mandibular, or the mental frame in here, this little dot. Oops. This little dot here. And this is the mandibular body. And if you have to measure things, you can do that either in Illustrator with the measure tool, or you can do it here in Photoshop. This is not Photoshop, this is Maya. You can do it here in Maya. Under Create, you can go to Measure Tools and select a Distance Tool. And if you do that and then just click on two points, so let's say from the bottom of the uh, mandibular border to the alveolar process, it will give you a measurement here. It's hard to read on the screen, but it's 2.6. So that's 2.6 centimeters. So you can do this stuff in Maya. You have to do it from the orthographic view, side view, uh, anterior view, or top view, not in the perspective view where you can tumble the, ca the camera around. Okay, so that's under Create Measure Tools Distance Tool. Okay, so you're doing a few more things than you did before in Maya and in Photoshop and Illustrator. Uh, and then in the next assignment after this, you're going to be a little more independent to do other things uh, rather than everybody drawing the same thing, too. So for the last thing I want you to do today is just to practice stippling. So you've got this stippling worksheet here, which I downloaded from the Internet. Don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I want you to change about it, though, unless you've already started, <laughs> um, you can see that they go to almost pure black in their core region here, their core shadow and they have a cast shadow and they've got this surrounding area here you don't have to do all this surrounding ugly stipple just the body of the objects and the cast shadow here but I don't want you I want you to take it up one value range so you can see in the top of this thing, there's a certain density. This is supposed to be the light struck region, and this is the midtone region, this is the core shadow region. I want you to shift those things so that actually this is the dark, not this space, but this value is lighter, and this value is lighter, and this value is lighter. So just take it up one notch. So not quite as dense, because I think this is just far too dense, and I don't want you to get that idea that that's what you're supposed to be doing. This is, if we shrunk this down, this would just turn to pure black. Okay? So this is just practice, I just want you to try. And again, forget all this surrounding stuff, except try and do the core shadow, just to figure out how that would work. Okay? Now I'm just going to run, because I've got to print up one more for our friend there.